Hello all, this is Dr. Dave Maslach talking to you about reciprocity.com. The E is written with a three. And in this particular video, I actually wanted to talk about latent versus manifest variables. I got my doggy on my lap. And this is, uh, there's a reason why I got, um, this is Carly. She's a sweetheart. She's about 12 years old. And um, I know that she absolutely adores me. Um, at least I think she does. Uh, so why am I actually, I'm going to put her down so she can get out of here because she clearly does not like sitting on my lap. <laughs> Poor girl. All right. She's gone. She's gone. All right. I'm just going to plug this back in. Um, so what I want to get into is, is, uh, talk about these latent versus manifest variables. Cause I think it's, it's a really incredible, incredibly important topic to anybody that is studying, um, science or a researcher, or just, you know, trying to get a grasp on how the world actually works. So we in science, um, those people that are doing, so I'd study organizations, um, what we try to do is actually come up with sort of theories of the world and these theories of the world they're generally imperfect but what we're trying to actually get at is what are called manifest constructs and these are kind of unobservable variables that um, that can explain a lot of different things so one of these unobservable variables that you might hear about or that we have sort of a commonplace one is is love right like how do we actually know if somebody actually loves us or how do i know that my dog loves me uh and it's not all that clear all the time and what we have to do so that would be the the uh, latent construct is looking at um or thinking about this construct of love right so i have some affection for her and i think I don't know. Um, I think she has affection for me, which would be maybe love, right? As we'd think about love. Um, so what we have to do is actually look at manifest variables or manifest indicators of this love to understand whether she actually loves me. And how do we actually do that? We have to look at these, these manifest indicators, which might be, you know, things like, okay, she's wagging her tail when she gets near me. She ran away right now, so she she was obviously annoyed with what I was doing, that I was picking her up. Um, she pants when she's around me. She likes to um, come come near me and, and rub against me. Um, you know, she really likes it when, when I give her some affection. She really is just very excited to see me all the time. So I think that those those uh, manifest indicators of all those different things. She wakes her tail. She likes to come near me. She, you know, she she's very uh, she she presents herself as affectionate. That that she actually loves me, right? And that is a latent construct or or a latent variable that that we're actually trying to sense and try to pick up, right? So that's the important thing that matters to me is whether she actually loves to be around me. And I, I, I actually love to be around her. She's my, she's my sweetheart. Um, and you know, that, that they're, they're my, uh, they're, they're my little babies. So um, why is this important to science? Because there's so many things around us that we can't observe. There's absolutely, most of the world that we look around us, most of the universe is unobservable. And, and in most sciences, it's actually a really difficult thing. So if you think about like, maybe you are studying the actual universes, right? You're in physics or something like that. And you have to study how actual universes work. Um, when we can't, for a large part of the universe, we can't actually observe everything, right? There's so much going on. Um, there's, there's a lot of unexplained things. And so what we have to do is actually have sort of theoretical constructs or theoretical ideas of how the world actually works to maybe look where there might be something happening, where there might be something a little bit interesting. And then we might study that particular area until it kind of comes, comes up that there is something interesting. So for example, um, I might think that because she loves me that she's not going to run away too much. 
um, you know, run too far away from me. So I might go and actually test that. I'd go out into a field and, you know, let her wander around, see if she can, see if I can call her back. Well, um, sometimes she doesn't like to come back. She gets really interested in something. So Matt, um, Carly actually gets interested in something. So she, uh, she, she, she won't wander back, but most of the times, so a lot of times she'll wander back. So indicating that she actually probably really does love what I'm doing, right? So in the same thing in science, um, this, this sort of stuff ha happens all the time. So in organizations, so I'm a professor of innovation strategy and entrepreneurship. In organizations, we have lots of things like that that we can't study. And some of them are really obvious that you might think about. So might be risk and uncertainty, right? So risk is this idea that um, we know what, so, so people know what the particular variables are, but they, they, and they know what, what something is going to happen and they kind of understand, you know, what it's the probability of something happening. They know they have a pretty good idea of that and they sort of do it anyway. So uncertainty is where you don't understand what the probability is of a particular thing happening and so you just but you do it anyways but we don't really have any sort of good measures for risk and uncertainty it's kind of difficult to calculate in in the real world we can maybe sort of get an idea for um, risk by doing sort of simple things like rolling dice um, you know uh, maybe having a random number generator or something like that but in the real world it, it, that's hard to put your finger on right we don't have random number generators and we don't have people don't roll dices um dices die uh, people don't roll die uh to to perform particular actions they just don't do that right so we have to figure out a way to to measure risk and uncertainty it, it simple ones like innovation right you'd think that we actually have a very good understanding of what un, uh, innovation is. But, you know, we have an idea of what it is, right? So it's this, this idea of creating something new and novel and and um, having it so it's it's applicable in the, uh, in the marketplace, right? So creating this particular, maybe it's a product or service or something like that, and having it so it's applicable, it's useful in the marketplace. Uh, but it's not all that easy to measure, right? So how do you actually go about measure it? Well, some scientists go about uh, measuring the number of products that people, that, that companies actually produce. Well, that's not really a good measure because some products are really important compared to others. Um, you know, the Apple iPhone is way more important than, I don't know, a little widget that, that comes along with the iPhone, right? Like the little extension cord or something, I don't know whatever but the you know like the, the the there is definitely it doesn't capture it very well by counting the number of products that that a particular company produces you know we could look at patents but some patents are more important than others and patenting is not necessarily the and, and a lot of people look at it, tons of people look at patents but patents are not really a good indicator of what how innovation actually is because they're actually not making anything they're just writing up patents right so that it's not necessarily all that clear and it might be the case that there are there are some companies that are very very litigious they have very good lawyers um, and they like to write up patents and other companies just will never write up a patent. It's just not part of what they do. It's not part of the DNA of the company. So, you know, it doesn't really capture that very well. And often, um, you know, things like this, that, that, that there is this ambiguity, right, between the manifest and the latent indicators, right? So the things that we're, we observe, so anything that we observe, so manifest indicators would be like the things that you could see with your five senses, right? Or um, see or observe with your five senses. You could actually see it, you could touch it, you can taste it and all that kind of stuff. Um, once you actually have an idea with these manifest indicators, we know that they're, uh, they're imperfect most of the time. And so where you can actually get very good contributions in science and good understandings and in, in progress science is look at where the manifest indicators are not really good indicators of the latent um, constructs, right? So when are the moments where the things we observe are not really capturing what we're trying to, the unobservable variables that we're really trying to capture. And that's where a ton of progress in science happens. That there is, you know, that, that it, we just have a very sort of poor understanding of this particular thing. We try to come up with all sorts of different ways to measure it. Sometimes we measure it with surveys. For example, we might go out and get different surveys. Um, you know, we might get 
what are called indicators in this or items in the survey, we might measure 10 different items, right? So it would be different ways to write up a particular question or a particular attribute that we're trying to get at. So we might ask, do you love your dog? Um, it might be, if your dog comes near you, do you, do you, do you show signs of affection? Uh, it might be, um, does your dog run up to you whenever you come in the door? Like there's all sorts of different questions that you can ask that can be signs of whether there is some sort of a love and affection that it's happening between your dog and you, right? That That's a, a clear thing or a clear way to measure what's going on. We can also get things like, you know, maybe that's imperfect, right? Because I'm, I'm sort of thinking through this and it's measuring more of, of me rather than my dog go. Um, maybe that we go and we count the number of tail wags that um, m uh, the dog does when I'm around versus when I'm not around. That actually might be a really good indicator of whether the doggy loves me. But then that depends on whether the tail wag is a predictor of affection. And, you know, you'd have to demonstrate that it actually is a predictor of affection and love, that the tail wake actually is. I think we kind of implicitly know that, but it's not really all that clear, right? So then how do you actually measure that, that there is this relationship? Well, then you'd probably have to look at maybe some theory at, or some papers that show that, or maybe you, you actually do an fMRI study or you throw a doggy in a um, fMRI uh, uh, functional uh, uh, magnetic resonance imaging machine, right? It's the thing they measure the brain, um, and, and I, you know, I'm, I'm that's kind of outside of my area, but I know some people do that kind of stuff. So you measure, yeah, you measure the uh, the sort of blood flow in your brain, and when you do that, then maybe when I when they're presented pictures, when doggies are presented pictures of me, that it lights up the one sort of pleasure center of the brain. And then that we can sort of understand that, oh, yeah, maybe that there is some love that's going on there, right? So um, there's that it's a clear thing, and, and it's an important thing to think about that there is these um, latent and manifest variables that are out there. And what we try to do is measure the latent variables as much as we can, so these are theoretical constructs as much as we can. But it's often the case that the manifest or the indicators of those, those latent constructs are not really all that good. Um, and then that's where there's going to be a lot of progress that's being being done in, in science. So that's all I wanted to talk about today. I think it's interesting. Hopefully you find that interesting as well. Um, this is all part of my uh, reciprocity project. The E is written with a three and it is a sharing economy proofreading platform that I'm trying to build that um, allows uh, allows you to actually get free proofreading if you sort of help out other people and you get credits for helping out other people you can also earn that those credits eventually once you get good enough can be converted into to money but then it also helps out science and because what uh, what i'm gonna do or what you know when once there's enough users on there i'll be able to ask like different questions or open it up and, and get researchers to go on there and uh, ask different questions and things like that and see how behavior works on there which would, would be really interesting right because we don't have something like this in science at this moment so it's a better way to get at so i think it's a better way to get at some of these um more manifest or more latent constructs that are difficult to capture by looking at some of the behaviors that you get on a software platform, which people already do. If you don't know that software companies, this is like uh, virtually all software companies now do these this kind of stuff. Um, it's very, very uh, omnipresent within the industry. So um, anyways, take care. That's all I wanted to talk about. Take care and have a wonderful day. Bye.